now that we've defined lists in Coq and written some interesting functions with them, let's prove some properties of lists and those functions. We'll start off with a really simple one. We noted before when we were doing some unit tests that if we took the empty list and appended it on the left side of another list, then it left the, the second list unchanged. So that was true for concrete examples that we've seen before. Let's prove it for all lists that could be on the right-hand side. So we set up the theorem to say that for all values LST of type nat list, empty append LST equals LST. This one actually goes through very quickly with reflexivity. Now, why does it do that? Well, if you think about how append is implemented, actually, of course, what we have here is a append app of the empty list onto LST. Right, that's what that syntactic notation with all of the other things in the middle here mean. In fact, really, it's nil, even if we want to make it as, as brutally simple as possible. So what happens when you take app and apply it to nil and LST? Well, let's go back to the definition of app up here and remind ourselves. If we pass in an empty list on the left-hand side here, that can immediately be pattern matched against and return the second list that was passed in. So that's the computation that reflexivity is actually doing here. It's taking the append of the empty list onto LST and saying, all right, I know how to simplify that. The append function is going to just return LST. So we get LST equals LST and we're done. Not everything can be proved that quickly, of course. So suppose we wanted to prove this theorem. For all lists, if I take the length of the list and then take the predecessor of that, remember that's that predecessor function on natural numbers, uh, it's truncated at zero. The predecessor of zero is zero. Well, that would be the length of the tail of the list. Okay, so that's a little more complicated of a theorem. Let's try proving it. We'll introduce that list that we're proving this of. Now, there's nothing I can do right now that's really helpful. We've seen this phenomenon before when we were talking about pairs. The issue is that to Koch, we don't it doesn't know what constructor list this list was constructed with. It doesn't know whether it's an empty list or whether it has an element. In other words, whether it was built with the nil constructor or the cons constructor. In order to make progress, we need to peel that apart, tell Koch to deconstruct that list. And we do that, of course, with the destruct tactic. This is like doing a pattern match, but we're doing it here in the proof script. So we'll destruct that list. Now remember that the pattern match here, uh, can, or the, the destruct here, contains an intros pattern. And this is like the things that would be written on either side of the two constructors that were defined as part of that inductive type nat list. It's just we don't write the constructor, constructor name there. So we've got nil on one side, cons on the other, and here's the data carried by cons. I'm choosing names for that. Here I've chosen H and T for head and tail. And there's no data carried by the nil constructor. So this is very much like how we used intros patterns for natural numbers, where on the left-hand side we had O, the zero constructor, and there was no data that it carried. And on the right-hand side, we had S, capital S, the successor constructor. Okay, so if we destruct that list, now we get two cases. We're used to destruct working that way from natural numbers. We get one for the case where the list is empty, and you can see it's substituted in the empty list there, and one for the case where the list was constructed with cons. And it's given the names that we chose for the two pieces of data carried there. I could have chosen something else. I could have written X and L here, for example, if I wanted. This would have X and L. So again, this is exactly how things were working before with natural numbers, but now we're working with lists. So I deconstruct that list. And in the first case, uh, now I've got something that's very uh, direct to compute with. Right, the length function, how was that defined? Let's remind ourselves up here. So if I scroll back up to length, the length function pattern matches on its first argument. Well, its only argument. And if that argument is the empty list, it immediately returns zero. So that is the piece of simplification, of computation that can go on down here. Uh, when we have length applied to the empty list, uh, well, that just reduces to zero. Likewise, tail of the empty list, you might recall, how was that defined? It was defined to be the empty list itself. So that pattern matches against the list that comes in and just returns empty. Cool. So that means on the right-hand side here, tail of empty will simplify to empty, and then length of the empty list, of course, will simplify to zero.
So reflexivity then suffices on both sides to take care of that. Oh, I forgot to mention the pred, right? So we're taking the length of the empty list on the left-hand side here. That is zero. The predecessor of zero is zero. And that's how pred was defined. Next, let's look at the more interesting case of when the list was constructed with cons. So I'm taking the predecessor of the length of a list that has at least one element in it. Now we know from the definition of length that it's going to add one in to the length of the tail. And we know that pred would then remove that one. So this is going to collapse just to the length of the tail. Likewise, on the right hand side here, we're taking the tail of h cons t. That's just going to be t. So we'll get the length of t on the right hand side. Okay, let me do a simple just so we can see where we end up with that. We've got length of t on both sides as we talked about. And of course, reflexivity then suffices to prove that. And I didn't actually need to do the simple step. Reflexivity will do the whole thing. So there we've proved that taking the length of the tail of a list is the same thing as taking the length of the list and just removing one from it. Now, we've done a proof of on lists with just reflexivity. We've done destruct. Most of the time, though, interesting theorems on lists are going to require induction. And that's because most of the time, interesting functions on lists are written with recursion. The two go hand in hand. So let's do a proof by induction. Here it will prove that append is associative. In other words, I could say list one, append list two, and then append list three to that result. Or I could say list one appended to the result of list two, append list three. So I'm changing where the parentheses are. Right. And that means that this operator of append is associative, like how the plus operator is associative in mathematics for, for the natural numbers. OK, so let's begin this one. I'll introduce my three lists. And now I'm going to do induction. I'm going to induct on the first list. So I'm doing induction on a data type, on this list data type, just like I've done it on data types before, like NAT. Right? And there's some similarity between list and nat, after all. They both have a constructor that represents something empty or zero. They both have a constructor that represents something one more than something else. In the case of the nat data type, it's there's a natural number that's one more than another. In the case of the list data type, it's that there is a list that is one bigger than another list by containing one new head element. Right? So I'm going to have two cases for lists, just like I did with natural numbers. I'm going to have a case for the first constructor and a case for the second constructor, which is to say a case for where the list was constructed with nil and another where it was constructed with cons. And as usual, I'll use an intros pattern to give names to the data carried by the constructors. So nothing to do here with nil. And I will name the head and the tail carried by the cons constructor as h1 and t1 here, the ones meant to remind me that they came from the first list here, lst1. Now, why am I doing induction on list one? I mean, could I do it on list two or list three? Um, this is something one gets uh, some intuition about after a while. But as a good rule of thumb, if you've got a choice between wh which lists to induct on, you probably want to do something that's based on how the functions you're using are pattern matching against it. And I know that append always pattern matches against its left argument. And I see list one showing up as a list left argument here and a left argument here. So that seems like a good thing to induct on at first. So I'll induct on it. And right away, you can see in the goals window, we've got what we would expect. We've got the list LST1 being replaced by nil in the first goal and being replaced by H1 cons T1 because those are the names I chose for the cons constructor here. All right, so in the first goal, ah, this one's actually going to work out quite nicely. Now, you might notice that cock is leaving off of these parentheses here on the right-hand side. That's because technically they don't need to be there. When we define the syntactic notation for app, we said it was right associative already. So that's the default place where those parentheses go. So you can think of them as still being around it right there. If that ever confuses you, there's a nice way to see what's really going on. Uh, you can tell cock set printing parentheses, and then it will print all of those parentheses, fully parenthesize everything, so that you can see unambiguously how cock is understanding the term that you have there. Also, if you ever wanted to see how append was being used there in terms of a syntactic notation, there's set printing all, which will in fact replace all of those nice syntactic notations with the more simple form that we had for them, like app and nil here. Okay, so if you ever get stuck, that's a useful thing to do.
In this case, we can finish off this first goal pretty quickly because the append operator, when it takes in on its left-hand side an empty list, is just going to return the right-hand side. So this left side of the equality is just going to reduce to list2 append list3. And of course, the same thing is happening here, knowing that the parentheses are around that. We've got append taking in an empty list on its left side. So that piece is going to go away. We'll be left with just list2 append list3. We could see that if we did a simple first. We've got list2 append list3 on both sides. But of course, reflexivity will take care of all of that. All right. In the second goal, where we have a list constructed with cons, now the terms have gotten a little more complicated and harder to read. Uh, when you first encounter a case like this, on when you've entered into an, an inductive goal here, it can be nice to try to simplify things just to clean it up and make it a little easier for a human to read. So let's just try that first. Okay. Now, what I notice is that I've got an inductive hypothesis up above here that says something about T1 append list 2, append list 3. And I also notice that down here, I've got exactly that same expression, right? And if it was unclear where the cons related to all of that, I could set printing parentheses again. And now I would be able to see that more clearly. The cons operator actually has lower precedence than these append operators in here. So indeed, that term is exactly the term up there in the inductive hypothesis. OK, so I could go ahead and rewrite with that inductive hypothesis then and replace the left-hand side of it with the right-hand side. Now, it takes a minute for the i to visually parse out, but it turns out I have the same term on both sides of this equality now. I've got h1 cons t1 append list 2 append list 3. h1 cons t1 append list 2 append list 3. So reflexivity finishes off that piece of the proof. And now I've proved that append is associative. It's worthwhile asking, as we've done once before, did I really learn something as a human from that proof? Arguably, I maybe didn't learn so much, right? This is not an informal proof designed to convey meaning to other humans. Rather, it is a formal proof in Koch's tactic language, and it's his proof script language, to be able to establish to Koch the truth of this statement up here. 